Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, working capital management or uh, the current asset management revenue cycle. Uh, and again, I'm keeping with my policy, trying to tell you what is the most practical part of this chapter. Uh, the issues of uh, that the uh, aging schedules, receivables management we're going to talk about is very practical. I'm, I can almost guarantee that all of you will see that at some point in your careers and probably within the first year or two. Uh, the material on the economic order quantity uh, inventory management, uh, you will not be asked to calculate an EOQ, but you will uh, probably have access or exposure to inventory management software. And essentially what we're going to be ta is talking about is how that software works and, and why it produces the, de the decisions that it does. So we're going to talk today, uh, uh, focus a lot on uh, receivables because that's the case next week. And essentially, uh, the case next week, you're going, to try, you're going to be asked to decide how aggressive to be in collecting receivables. And this is a really a big issue in healthcare, and we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. So uh, when we talk about working capital, there's usually a whole bunch of topics that go into that and the, what is what we mean by working capital, but typically it's cash management, marketable securities, revenue cycle, and so on. We're going to go through each one of these briefly. So cash management, essentially, as we talked about in previous classes, the goal is to have the minimum amount of cash that you need to run the business. You don't want too much cash because then you're foregoing interest. On the other hand, you don't want to, uh, not enough cash because then you're into either borrowing costs or, or insolvency, which is not good either. Uh, <clears throat> there are lots of different cash management techniques, and th th these techniques, uh, really I can't express how fast they're changing in the real world, uh, because a lot of them were, 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 uh, have their origins when uh, basically uh, bills were paid using checks and paper ex uh, means of exchange. Now, as we move more and more towards electronic exchange, these techniques are changing very quickly. Uh, on the other hand, um, a lot of people who, uh, the age group that uses healthcare the most are seniors, and they use checks, and they still use a lot of paper-based transactions. Uh, so the, the, it's, it will be with us, paper-based checks and those kinds of things will be with us, I think, probably for another 10 to 15 years uh, when and then maybe it will disappear entirely. But for now, uh, cash management is, is, a, is still something that healthcare organizations have to worry about. The basic concept of cash management is float. A net float is the difference between what you think you have on your bank, on your own books compared to what's on the bank's books. So <clears throat> we suppose we've got a, a, a family healthcare here that writes $2,000 in checks daily. It takes six days for the, the, the checks to get from the uh, practice to the bank for it to be deposited. So on, on average, there's disbursement float, which is good, which is $12,000. Essentially, that's free financing in a way because you're writing the check today. You write, it comes out, of you, you think it's coming out of your bank account, but in fact, it doesn't actually clear the bank for another six days. On the other hand, patients are giving you money uh, and which, uh, say in this example, $3,000, and it takes three days to, to get that through, that's called collections float. And that's bad because you want the money faster than, the, the, as fast as possible. Disbursement float is good because you, it's essentially you're paying your bills later, but you want uh, collection, uh, collection bad float is, is bad because you want to collect the money as fast as possible. So the difference between the two numbers, the 12,000 minus the 9,000 is 3,000. So what that is, is it's the average difference between what, the, what, you, what you have on your books and what the bank has on its books as to what uh, amount of cash you actually have in the bank at any one point of time. So one way to maximize the good float is by accelerating receipts and slowing down disbursements getting your money in fast as possible and slowing down the, uh, the paying of bills to, to, the, to, the, to the most reasonable extent possible. So there's lots of different methods for receipt acceleration, including the ones that are, that are listed there. I told you about one a few weeks ago uh, about a service that we're now using where a, uh, 
company, a truck goes around to all our sites at Piedmont and gets the cash and the checks that have been collected that day. And then some guy sits in the back of the van and feeds the cash and the checks through a scanner. And then that money is deposited right in our bank account, literally on the road as, the, as they're heading back to the bank. So that, that, that's sort of an innovation uh, that, that, uh, that's all, that didn't exist a year or two ago. But it's a way for us to accelerate the receipt of cash and checks so that there's very little delay between getting the money and then actually showing up in our bank, our bank account. A disbursement controls the other side of receipt acceleration, which is essentially slowing down your disbursements to the, the most reasonable extent possible. And payable centralization, that is used a lot by health systems. So um, a health system that's got four or five or ten different hospitals, uh, the, the, and the, the uh, expenses for all of those separate, the, the children of the, of the, of the system are, are paid centrally by the parent organization so that there's a centralization. They get, they, they get a economies of scale and the, the uh, uh, variation in the uh, amount of time that is that the, from between the bill is received and paid is standardized and minimized cost minimized as a result. Uh, marketable securities management, uh, because uh, cash comes in, cash goes out uh, every day, uh, sometimes too much cash goes in, so organizations will then use that excess cash and park it in marketable securities, primarily for two reasons. One, it's, uh, cash is what is called a, a non-earning asset. You do not earn anything by having cash in a bank account. So you can park cash temporarily into marketable securities where it earns at least some interest. The objective here is not to make a return. It really is, uh, is, to, uh, is liquidity. It's, it's, it's parking in a temporary spot in order to make sure that you get at least some return on it, but you're not looking for big returns here. So in reality, cash management and marketable securities management happens at the same time. Cash in, goes in, cash comes out, a little bit of cash is extra, it goes over the marketable securities. Uh-oh, we need some cash here. The marketable securities come back into the, in, into the uh, cash account and so on. So these things are all happening, so happening simultaneously. And the larger the organization, so Duke, UNC, for example, they'll park large amounts of money in marketable securities for seven days or 10 days because 100 million bucks parked for seven days, even though it's only seven days, even though it's only one or 2% interest, that adds up to t t you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of interest. <clears throat> uh, they're ch chosen on the basis of safety, so you're, you're gonna see uh, things like CDs, uh, those kinds of uh, money, money market funds. The amount of return is secondary. Really, it depends on the site, how long you want to hold it. If you know you're not going to need the cash for 30 days, you can buy a, a T-bill for the 30 days. Uh, if, you can, if you're only going to hold it for a day or two, you might want to hold it in a, a money market account. And again, the size of the business, because a lot of these marketable securities will have differential rates of interest based on the size of the issue. So if you, if you park zero to $100,000, you get one rate of interest. If you, if you park 10 million or more, you'll get a different rate of interest. So again, the sophistication and the tools, the assets that are chosen, really depends on the size uh, of the business and how long it's going to be held. Revenue cycle. Now I'm gonna call on the birthday boy because he has experience in revenue cycle, as I recall. <laughs> So what is Revenue Cycle, Robbie? Tell us about your life prior to the MHA program. Um, so it's basically managing your receivables. Um, what I did was the last bullet on there, financial counseling. So the section that talks about trying to identify who's most likely to pay um, the services that we identify the services that we're likely to lose money on so we get paid up front. He's not joking, by the way, are you? Was this uh, so? What were some of the challenges you faced? I mean, 
What was what, what were the mo what were the most difficult parts of that kind of activity? Um, I would say balancing the needs of the organization, as in you know keeping keeping the doors open or keeping the money rolling in versus the the needs of the patient and not destroying you know getting the money that we for the service we provided but not destroying the goodwill between the facility and the patient in the process. All right. Um, especially those that were in the middle <clears throat> that we were going to get payment from them eventually establishing payment plans and things like that. That means there's a certain section that you're never going to get the money from anyway. So, so how, what kinds of training did you see given to the patient financial counselors as to how to probe and how to, how to do that? Well, those are really very uh, insightful comments because uh, that, I mean, that's certainly my experience as well. They are very difficult conversations to have. Uh, I mean, I, I re literally remember a patient handing over five bucks from her purse just for, because, and it was the last five bucks she had in her purse. She had no other money. And so it really is a tough thing to do to sit in those. I really have a lot of empathy for the financial counselors because sometimes they're dealing with very difficult patient situations. Um, so revenue cycle is, is exactly uh, what uh, Robbie uh, has described. Uh, generally, uh, Lou likes to break it down into sort of three kinds of categories before services, uh, pre-service insurance verification where we phone the insurance company or Medicare or whatever to make sure that the patient is actually entitled and insured for that service. Uh, same with managed care patients. And then the financial counseling, telling the patient here are going to be the financial consequences of you accessing care. At service activities, uh, time of insurance, service insurance verification, uh, that happens on the day of service provision because sometimes people lose their insurance between the pre-activity and actually showing up. There's claims, all kinds of forms to be filled out and, and produced. And then the after service, the claim submission. What's denials management? It's usually like department and patient access that will go to bat with the insurance company about uh, denials and things like that. And so, so what are some reasons why a claim might be denied? Um, either like it didn't match the utilization and review that the insurance company applied to it, or somehow the paperwork got filed incorrectly. Sometimes uh, they say that they just deny just to see if someone will appeal. Really, I'm uh, that I'm, I'm arbitrary. That, that's not like a, obviously. a standard pr procedure. So denials management, there are whole courses that you can take in denials management because they are very expensive because essentially the organization has provided the service Costs have been expended, incurred, uh, and there's no revenue for that. So <clears throat> the managing that process to minimize that amount, and it's for many other reasons besides the ones that Meredith mentioned as well, uh, there'll be one little code or a comma could be in the wrong field. We'll bounce it back. Sometimes people think that they're entitled to their pre, the pre-assurance uh, verification was for a specific procedure, and then when they get in the operating room, they got to do something else, and that's not covered. Um, and th that gets picked out. There are a lot of different possibilities. And then finally, monitoring, reviewing, and improvement. Um, basically, that means uh, monitoring how you're collecting, what kinds of coding errors you've got, what kinds of dials management, and continuously quality, quality improvement. Uh, I've heard CFOs say that uh, just improving the skills of the coders 
uh, in his or her finance department can boost revenue five ten percent just just by coding more accurately coding more comprehensively making sure that everything that was done to the patient has been captured in the claim so it's a, a whole uh, industry out there of, of consultants who do nothing else but go into healthcare organizations and do revenue cycle improvement. Uh, it typically starts with a charge master review. What's a charge master? Yeah, it's a list of everything you do and a list of the charges that are on that uh, for each of those uh, activities, services, or whatever. So what a, what a revenue cycle consultant will do will go in and look at your charges and make sure that <clears throat> they, are, uh, a pr uh, they reflect the current market prices in that area. Because you do <clears throat> if your prices are too low, what, what are the consequences of that? If your charges are too low, Well, what do insurers typically pay an organization? A percent of your charges. You know, they'll say, here's our charge, and we're going to pay you 70% of it, or 50% of that charge. So if your charges are lower than they can be, if based on the market reality, essentially you're leaving money on the table because the insurer would have, paid a high, a high, would have paid a percent of a higher charge, so your revenue would have been higher. So the revenue cycle consultants, they basically come through and look at all your charges and make sure they're up to date and they are, reflect the market reality so that you don't leave money on the table.